seniors are probably just like oh my god like were we like that when we were sophomores and yeah they probably <laughs> were like quite like that so yeah like, that's wow, funny sophomores so crazy like please stop being weird right yeah and I, I mean we know we have they've said multiple times in the show that the this this sophomore a class is a, a special unique bunch there's there's never been a class quite like them um but i think you're probably right like i think and i was gonna say like oh i bet the the a class felt that way too when they were seniors but then i was like no they know like that they're Mm-mm. legit legit ridiculous and they've been ridiculous like the entire time that they've existed at adams so yeah it's a they're having fun they're having crazy times <laughs> Here we go. We're jumping into it. We're back, even though to them, we're not back because they won't hear this episode (laughs) for like another few weeks because I have to edit the other episode that we recorded, but I haven't touched. Um, (laughs) Even saying that, though. (laughs) uh, Hello, everybody. I'm Maggie. And I'm Maddie. And this is... Ambition on Pet. Yes, it is. And we are alive. Um... As I just mentioned, I it's not that we have not recorded. We recorded 107 maybe like two months ago, and then I just <laughs> haven't edited it for people. I mean, people know that stuff's going on for the writers over here for other reasons, um, but that obviously also affected this. But I'm thinking of it like we're just in our Sabrina Carpenter 2020-2021 era where like we're holding yeah. on to stuff, and it's just in our, our little safe of content huh. and we just haven't released it yet so we're almost yeah. into it's, it's our gonna emails come back i can't send era <laughs> yes it's gonna be a bot like everyone's gonna love it back on <laughs> rack and also yeah i mean it's just a very crazy time out there so everyone i hope everyone is staying safe and yes. um thriving as much as possible in these crazy crazy times indeed um, i agree yeah. And I was just saying to Maggie, thank you for listening. If you're listening, we love you. Yes. It's uh thank you for your patience and for being silly and, and fun and unpacking things with mm-hmm. us on mm-hmm. Ambition Unpacked. Yeah. Yeah. Which... Loving ambition enough to <laughs> unpack all these little things. Ooh. Right now we are on episode one oh eight. We have continued onward. We have made it into the second half of season one which genuinely is exciting because i think the second half of season one is uh far superior to the first half of season one not to be mean to my own show but (laughs) it's true it is true and that's okay you know it took time it was stewing and now it's like the flavors are like rising yes yes combined yeah. It's a little like, you know, every show has a little bit of a you have to get into it sort of thing. Like, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's the first season and it's time to develop. But I think there's just such a clear period in my mind of, of these next handful of episodes of like, because I think all these episodes, when we talk about air date, we can talk about this a little bit. But this starting here, the last episodes, all within June, all within 20 days. It was just like, bam, 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 mm-hmm. dropping wow. them. And, the, and they and felt they so good. like, okay, things are finally picking up and things like moving. Things were really so. happening. Yes. That Can was you a, even that imagine was having... actually one of the best months ever. <laughs> That's so sweet. Oh my goodness. Uh, and can you believe it's now been legit over three years? Because it's no. now July 2022 and that was June 2019. That's so... insane. That's so weird. That's weird, right? (laughs) I was just thinking when I was rereading 108, I was like, I think there's a note in there somewhere where it's like, it really feels like now that we're in, we're very deep in, not deep, but we're in season four. You know, like it's moving. We've had episodes come out. We're going to have the third episode come out in just two weeks as we record this. Um, And I was just thinking about like, they really are so baby in season one, like B-A-B-I-E, like Mm-hmm. I'm like I, I see them in my head from back in season one and I'm like oh my god like you're a little fetus like look at you oh my goodness um and it's funny because obviously that's not necessarily true because we can't actually see them but I think it just feels like when we were in the moment writing season one it didn't feel that way like it didn't feel like oh they're baby mm-hmm. like it was the moment mm-hmm. and now it, it really is feeling like 
they're in college now and it's been three years since we wrote that and it really is like we're all growing and they're not baby anymore I mean they'll always be baby in my heart but they're not baby anymore (laughs) yes the tone is different there's that real I was saying this to Ellie yesterday I was like it's so different being 25 and you know living like the working life Mm -hmm. um and that's kind of like the point that they're more getting to like they're still not at that exactly but the difference between being like a sophomore in high school and (laughs) in college is so huge yes and and that's I mean I think we're jumping way ahead but obviously this is this is not a spoiler free podcast um but i mean (laughs) josh matthews is that in this season where it's like Mm -hmm. they're still in their world of like we just came out of high school and we're in college and we have these dreams and josh has been like trying to live his dream for four years and is like i my life is (laughs) a tragedy (laughs) um so i think we talked about how we both we both find josh very relatable because we're like literally Mm. living the same age as him in that same era of our lives um but yeah and some and someday when we get to season five they're Ooh. all gonna be there and they're all gonna be adults which is i'm kind of scared for them because you know it's not always fun. <laughs> it's it can be rough nice. out here sometimes yeah, yeah sometimes, <laughs> good, sometimes bad i love to see them i i definitely love seeing where people go now when i watch like a teen tv i'm always like where do they go where do they end up and mm-hmm. I just mean like where are they when they're 25 um but it is really out. nice to go back and just see these little babies these yeah. cuties that we love and they're just so it's it's a lot more it's a lot more simple mm-hmm. um and that is very comforting in these trying times <laughs> that's true and that's the crazy thing too is like I was I was talking to some of my friends and we were talking about like oh you know it's been x years since we like were in high school and just mm-hmm. that feeling of when we get to season five and they're at that age, you know, like season five to season one, it'll have almost been a decade in showtime, which is mm-hmm. like, holy shit, right? Like, that's so insane. <laughs> um, that's, but we're very, yeah. very far away from that right now. So <laughs> well, it's been it's been a decade since I was in like sophomore year. Yeah. Isn't that's that weird? <laughs> <laughs> it's, and everyone's like oh my god look at these oldies <laughs> so old. uh, but that's where the realism comes from folks that's mm-hmm. right of your what you know right your own experience and let me tell you um okay so <laughs> now that we had that wonderful existential crisis to start us <laughs> off um we can just jump right into the episode when they are baby which this mm-hmm. episode is as we said episode season one episode eight it is called these boots aren't made for dancing and for the title i'm just going to give the full credit to esther right off the bat that was one of the ones that she came up with really early on she's a genius i thought it was so fun i thought it was so perfect um because it's this perfect kind of a light fun twist on something and it fits the theme so well and also i just love um shout out to lucas's boots you know Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's, you know, their time to shine, really. And they won't be shining because they're dirty from the street. (laughs) They won't be shining because they're dirty, period. (laughs) (laughs) So true. Um, Yeah, so that is, that's the title. It's, otherwise, I enjoy it. I think it's one, I think it's one of the stronger ones in in this season, just because it does have that, that wonderful ambition uh, flavor to it. Um, In terms of our stats for this episode, I've got them here. The word count for this episode is 10,309 words. Nice. So so we're increasing. We're getting up there. Still miles and miles and miles away from where we are now. But at season one, this was, you know, it was getting up there. So we're increasing in that regard. Uh, the runtime with that is 47 minutes. The page count, when I have it in my PDF version, is 20 pages. And there are eight songs in this episode one of which is purely an instrumental so also as i said it aired now that we actually have air dates because of archive of our own having all those records for me thank you to ao3 shout out Mm -hmm. uh it was june june 3rd 2019 so this was the first one of the june set and as we know i mean the last episode was like three like two and a half weeks later so (laughs) craziness 
but those are our those are our little stats. I mean, we've had the this is when it was posted, but in the timeline mm-hmm. of the show, this is meant to be like right after the previous one, isn't it? Yes, um, because as as they go into the episode, it kind of talks about how this the conceit of the episode, you know, culture swapping is coming right off the heels of we've just made this truce, which is so fun. They're so dramatic. We've just made this truce about you know like the techies are gonna have rights now, and we're gonna we've crafted up a social contract <laughs> that we're gonna be <laughs> nice and understand each other more. So um, yeah, it's very mm. soon after. And that's one of the interesting things about this show, too, is, like, because they often, the seasons often span a year, some episodes, you know, are kind of, like, right one after the other because of the plot at that time is, like, oh, we need to follow up on this. And then other times it's, like, oh, we skipped two months. (laughs) So you kind of have to reorient yourself every episode. But these are very close together, so. To be fair, that is life, isn't it? Like, yeah, (laughs) you have busy months and then you have, like, two months where you're just, like, what even happened? Yeah. That's true. So obviously we have also our episode rankings, but we will save that for the end when we discuss. And then the caption at the top here is yeah. culture swap is the tagline. As part of the truce, the performers and techies walk a mile in the other's shoes, almost literally. Some students are more equipped for the change than others. A technician performance at the end of the week promises plenty of surprises. It's it, it, it is what it is like it's, this is one of those ones where it's like yeah that's what happens okay <laughs> yeah it's good it's nice um and simple like you know how I do get a little bit overwhelmed with the current uh lengthiness of <laughs> the episodes later on um mm-hmm. it is kind of it's nice and I think it almost is like it is representing just the very like simple issue that they're up against as well. Mm-hmm. It's just like you guys are being a bit silly and <laughs> right. The whole thing. Yeah, and I think it's nice to have a, a few episodes, you know, every now and then where it's like the synopsis is just this is what it is. Whereas we know I like to be uh, cheeky and I like to be <laughs> sneaky and like mislead people with things, but sometimes it's nice to break that up with a little bit of just like here's what it is because it uh. It keeps the sneakiness and the cheekiness fresh, you know? It's never like, oh, I have mm. to second guess every single thing that Maggie writes because sometimes I'm just telling you what it is. <laughs> this is a good one. I love this episode. Um, I think it is, like, up there with the, the top tier. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Um, I think it just really, it just really, like, sets the tone for the rest of the season and has a lot of kind of long arc sort of yeah it um it feels it feels a lot more like seasons two and three than any of the other previous Mm. ones even even 107 where stuff really did start to get going it still was very season one Mm -hmm. but i think here they just all kind of come into themselves and yes one thing i'll say to that point too that i think you're you think you're kind of speaking to is one note that i had when i was reading the episode was this is the first episode to me that really feels kind of like an ensemble episode like the a class mm-hmm. is an ensemble mm-hmm. because we're really getting more of uh, the techies as like the other techies are more participant and like Haley and clarissa get more mentions and yindra mm-hmm. and nigel are like sitting with the mains like there's just more of the sense of the class as a whole and i think this is the first episode where we really feel that and it feels less about like here's the four or five characters that we are following and it's more like here's the whole class like doing something yeah. together yeah and I don't know if you can like comment on this but mm-hmm. I think because you you plan season two sort of first right and so it feels yes. like this one is more it's more determined in that way like you are getting to the point where the plan is kind of that plan is coming to action and you're not sort of just almost setting up the characters to get to that it's like okay these these plans are starting to come to fruition and, and we're really setting up for those um bigger kind of themes here i definitely think that is i, I definitely highlighted some stuff in the episode that as we talk through it i'll point it out but like i think you're i think you're right i don't know if necessarily my brain knew it at the time you know what mm-hmm. i mean like i think as as story one of the great things about storytelling is you you know you lay it down and then you just build on these things but obviously we knew where things wanted to go but I think one of the nice things about this episode is that to that point as we know in season two like 
everything goes to shit. So Mm -hmm. this idea of, like, we're getting this glimpse here in this episode of, like, oh, like, yes, there's still some tensions, but, like, they can work together and it can be a full class and it can be not this huge divide where everybody's upset with each other. And I think by seeing the glimpse of that here in this episode and then a couple of times in like 110 kind of has that feeling as well, it makes the loss of that hurt more in season two. And then, you know, season three, like all the episodes feel like that because the class is a class. So it's really interesting to have like this, this glimpse of that feeling here and then we lose it. But it's kind of, you know, that sense of like what's to come. We're seeing a little bit of that. Definitely. So exciting. Um, and I also think that this episode is just generally, you you said for the first seven episodes, you know, it was like, it was always tense. It was so tense. And yeah. this episode does not feel that way at all. Yeah, I agree. I definitely feel that it's it's still got a little bit of tension. There is a little bit of, of course, like. Naturally. <laughs> um, but it's more, it's not like everyone is so like angry within themselves anymore. Mm-hmm so nice honestly it's definitely good to note that (laughs) and to that point too one of the things that and i'll talk about the specifics of this as we're actually in it but i think this is an episode that has a lot of really interesting character moments or like defining character traits just peppered Mm -hmm. in and they're not big moments or big deals but i have a lot of yellow highlights of like oh that's really intrinsic to this person's character so Mm -hmm. i'm excited Mm -hmm. to chat about that a little bit so So I just dive right in then. Let's do it. Let's do it. So th- we jump right in with a song. We jump in with uh, the techies getting kind of pulled into grooving with the performers to Better When I'm Dancing, performed by Megan Trainer. Um, I think I'm going to be up front. Like, do I like Megan Trainer that much? No. Um, so like as suggested the song, I thought it was cute. I was like, sure, that's great. I do think it is still cute. Is it mm-hmm. my fave in the episode? No. But it's cute, and the scene it is. itself is cute. It is cute. It um, it definitely has the tone of the movie soundtrack, like children's movie soundtrack that it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, <laughs> which is fine, and it works for this moment as well because it is meant to be this like upbeat, like it, like that moment at the end of the kids movie where everyone is right. together. <laughs> um, which is yes. funnily enough at the start of this episode, but um. It's, it is interesting that it is at the start of the episode that we're seeing them all kind of try to dance and sing together mm-hmm. um, because obviously then in the rest of, you know, the duration of the episode, there is a lot of sort of stuff that goes against that nice, yeah. happy vibe. Yes. Um, um, oh, and that just reminded me of something too. Don't let me forget, we're probably both going to mm-hmm. forget, but don't let me forget that I wanted to say something about Lucas and Farkle when we get to Lucas and Farkle scene in regards to the the crux of this episode and the longer picture, the longer goal picture of the story. Okay. Ooh, okay. Anyway. Yes. Um, so yeah, this section I think is is just very cute. Um, and I, I really like getting to see like Zay kind of like interact with the techies like I think the moment that he like twirls Jade is like very sweet very cute um mm-hmm. and the fact that she's like oh my fucking god like because she's not a performer she's like please don't make me do this but she's gonna have to fucking do it um and then my, my favorite moment is uh when Dave knocks over the desk like it's a legacy moment yeah <laughs> yeah that is definitely a moment where it's like Dave like top 10 yeah <laughs> clumsy giant like cutie pie who just is too big yeah like I can just see this has this episode has a lot of moments that I can see really perfectly in my head and that's one of them it's just him like dancing like knocking that dust over and Nigel and Yogi like losing it because it's just so funny to them I love that yes yeah I can so see like Yogi like falling over with his laughter because he's just (laughs) having a good time yes and I love the um... great spot because so many people are just in that first yes yeah, you look at all those capital letters <laughs> as they're getting oh. introduced. Um, I love that also there's a very early nod here to uh, Dancer Jeff because he, they, you know, it says that he's the mm. only one with a semblance of rhythm in his body of the techies. Um, so it's kind of like, oh, we, we don't even know yet how much that's going to be like a re- recurring thing for his character. Yeah. But yeah. I love it. So good. Yeah, it's amazing. I think that's one of the really cool things about going through all the episodes like this is we are finding a lot of 
these little moments that you planted early on mm-hmm. that I think at the time we would just kind of skip over because it wasn't really yeah. anything to note. And then once they all build up later on, hmm, beautiful. Right, exactly. And you know, people should know I'm always doing that. And even now in season four, I'm still doing that. So everything, obviously we won't know until we know, but when we finally get to later seasons too on this podcast that will take us 10 years, um, we'll, we'll always be finding things to be like, hey, remember that? There you go. Um, but yeah, so that's this kind of cute opening number. I love that it's it's just adorable, really. Yeah, it is. Just 100%. And then um, and then it's just like, but why is it necessary? Like, I just know that. <laughs> it's the, it's yeah. cute. And then, but why? But why? But why? why? Are we here? Yeah. I mean, that's probably what, like, Maya is saying in her head, but that's okay. <laughs> So, um, like, what is going on? Yeah, so, yes, then. We have a, a shot of Maya. She's just like, what? Like, she's looking <laughs> at the, the tech he's trying to dance, and she's just very she's confused. Like, oh, God. Oh, God. Um, so, yeah, Sean and Angela explain to us that the conceit for the week is going to be that the techies and the performers are going to swap their jobs, basically. So, the techies are going to be doing a performance at the end of the week, and they're going to be working on that all week while the performers are going to be learning how to do their jobs um i wanted to highlight one of my favorite little character lines here so angela starts talking about how like you know the classes come to a truce and like as i said earlier they're so dramatic well charlie's version of that is for him to fondly say this school is bananas um which i love for two reasons one i think it's just such a charlie thing to say like to call Mm -hmm. not to be like this school is fucking cracked which it is but to be like bananas the school's bananas he just has Mm -hmm. like the silliest way of speaking um (laughs) but the other piece of that is just i think it's such a cute one of those first little character moments i think it's such a cute example of like how much charlie really loves adams and like yes he's got his probs but like he loves that school like that is his place and that is those are his people even though he Mm -hmm. they maybe don't think of him as their person at this point but yes. he just loves it so much. And that makes his whole arc with Adams, like, even even harder, like, when he has mm-hmm. to leave. And then when he says, you know, when he gets accused of the vandalism and he goes to tell Jack, like, I didn't do it. And he says in that scene, like, I love Adams and I would never, ever do anything to do, like, harm it. And I think mm-hmm. that even now, like, you can see that that's true. I completely agree. He just, he he knows the value of it. Even when mm-hmm. he's like, this is so weird. He's like, I love it, though. Yes. We'll I mean, kind of come back to that when we get to season two and he has his um, monologue to Eric at the end of the season because it kind of plays into that as well. Yes. We have a wee so, while to go. <laughs> until Yeah. Then. So in three years, <laughs> we talk about that episode. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I just I love him. Uh, so that's what they're going to be doing. That's why I say it's a culture swap, baby. And as we can see, it's a mixed reaction to this. Like, most people are like, ooh, this is going to be fun. Like, okay. And then you have Lucas and Farkle being like, fuck this shit. I don't want to do it. <laughs> and that's fair enough. Um, but it's going to be fun. And cue opening titles. Ooh, I'm famous, I'm famous. <laughs> Sing it. All right. <laughs> So then we get into this scene in the cafeteria where they're discussing this. And this is one of my favorite scenes in the episode. It just has so many fun moments Mm -hmm. and lines and like exchanges. Um, One thing that I love about this moment is when we get set up right from the beginning, it's like, who's at this table? Farkle, Maya, Zay, Charlie, Nigel, Yindra. Like how many mains can we stuff in one table this early on that we don't even realize are like going to be main mains, you know? I just yeah. love it. Yeah, it's so it's it's so odd honestly because it does make you realize because you you know it you're like, "Ooh, that's weird. They're all sitting together." And it's like it is quite strange. Especially <laughs> and then, you know, Maya does snark at Charlie and yes. it's like, yeah, <laughs> these people don't usually associate at all really so it's quite different yes i so i highlighted that exchange between charlie and maya um so they're all like i don't want to do this and charlie's like oh come on maybe it'll be good for you all to 
learn something. Which, to his credit, like, that's a little sassy. Like, good for him for getting that dig in there. Um, (laughs) And then Maya responds, I'm sorry, when did we promote you to speaking level? And I love that line for two reasons. The first reason is that it's a little bit meta. It's a little bit like, oh, Charlie is now suddenly more important than he was for the first four episodes, you know? Um, So it's kind of a joke. But also, to me, that's, like, one of the quintessential Maya lines. Like, the way that she's thinking in her head, like, oh, we're the we're the protagonists of the yes. story and i haven't thought of charlie as a protagonist therefore like i have to ask this snarky question and we see you know that line comes back in season three because like in the hallucination that she has my Ma- riley as maya says that to her and it's kind of like this flip moment of like oh shit like that's what it feels like when someone says that to you um yeah. so it's just a very like if I had to list out, like, oh, ten lines that are definitive Maya Hart, like, this would definitely be on that list. Yeah, this scene really, it really feels, yeah, that ensemble and Maya kind of being confronted with the fact that the ensemble includes Charlie. And that's just <laughs> not something she was contending with prior to this. Also, like, and- listen, I will say, I don't know if this comes through at all, because like you said, they don't interact that often, but, like, I love Maya and Charlie. I think they are one of the funniest duos in the entire show because of the fact that they are basically kind of like, I think I was talking to Natalia, our our beta, about this, and I was like, it feels like they're kind of like rich in-laws. Like, they're Mm -hmm. like not, like, they're just associated through other people and they kind of have to, like, deal with each other. But there is also at the same time this kind of weird perverse fondness that they have for each other where it's like, I don't think I actually like you as a person, but you're kind of like my my in-law that I'm like, okay, like, fine, I will deal with you. I'm going to build this weird dynamic that we have. And they also just kind of have like such a comedic, which is refreshing, especially for Charlie, because Charlie has such a heavy storyline but like that, like the way they're in season two, where Maya's like, "Oh, Charlie must have a crush on me. Like he's in love with me, and I'm gonna go <laughs> reject him." Um, and like you know, just building from there. And uh, having been working on, I'm currently working on uh, season four, episode three, and they have some great exchanges in that as well. Like they're just they're very. I really really enjoy writing them, even though they are a much smaller piece mm-hmm. of the full ensemble puzzle. Yeah, they're under the radar. But I feel like that is something that often comes through in in TV shows. There's often these little dynamics that are rare and you don't get to see them as much, but they can be so much more not special, but like fun in those ways because they don't necessarily talk about really like deep, like they don't have these like big kind of moments. They just have funny little. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Yes. I totally get it. All this to say, if I could make gifs i would have made many gift sets already of maya and charlie with like their five moments and just for fun because i i love them um so yes she gets snarky with charlie we have that amazing line and then uh zay nudges charlie and he almost chokes because yeah he's gay um (laughs) so you know good for him it's it's interesting because yeah in rereading i feel like we've both noticed that They've actually, you know, associated a fair amount Mm -hmm. and, you know, they kind of didn't really talk to each other properly until this, like, what was it? One or three? Yes. Um, But like they, they've sat together and they, um, I think a a couple of points, Charlie has nudged Zay. Yes. We've talked about how Charlie is always looking for the, um. The, the sweep the sweep touch she's like let me yeah. slide in there do a little touch and then slide out <laughs> yeah um so it's interesting I feel like in this episode Charlie is just he's just a little bit more thirsty maybe and it's really <laughs> getting to him he's just yeah really I think that is mind. so interesting we'll talk more about that as we go but I think Charlie is like at this place where I think for even as he's been doing all those things we just talked about he's still also so in denial and I think that all through up to this point he's been like kind of turning it off like not like looking the other way like not really 
acknowledging what he's actually feeling and I think it's partially denial but partially just kind of like repression like I don't think he he does not really truly understand like oh like shit I actually have a crush on Zay until next episode when they have that whole moment Mm -hmm. and right now so all of these little moments are just like well this just happened but no it's fine and this just happened but well no wait and like he's always kind of like either turning it off or rejecting it or pretending it didn't happen. Like, so it's yes. just, he's in this constant, like, he's insane. It's kind of like yes. the bottom line. But I think that's why like, as these continue to happen, it gets more and more frequent. And also I think Zay and Charlie are kind of like, I think Charlie's at this point of like, I think he thinks in his head, like, oh, I just really, 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 really want to be friends with Zay. And I'm almost mm-hmm. there. Like, they're kind of on the friend zone where it's, like, they're almost friends. Like, they're friendly, but they're not yeah. yet friends. And at the end of yeah. this episode, like, they're they're going to cross into that point. But Char- that Charlie thinks his obsession is, like, I just really want to be his friend. I, that's all it is. That's I just really want to be his friend. And then it's, like, nobody. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, he's kind of reached that point where the glass is breaking. Like, these are the cracks are showing... Because prior to this, when he was like, I'm nudging Zay because we're going to be friends. And this is like me, like becoming his friend. And that's all it is. Yep. No questions. Blah, blah, blah. Everything's fine. And now he's like, mm, no. Mm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, as we get another ensemble member to join this little scene here, when Lucas comes over and he hands them all little forms that they typed up about like here's what you're gonna learn this week like whatever i would love to know who typed up that form like it's got to be asher because i can't imagine anybody else being like here's an organized list of everything we should teach them you know dylan like wrote a list he'd be like we're gonna learn about like how to like do the best jump off the highest point of the problem like he'd be writing all this stupid stuff so it's like it had to have been asher (laughs) yeah that was like asher and jade's like little like project that they were like let's go to the computers and like do this and it was very <laughs> right beautiful. like maybe jeff helped too because he is the only one that knows a thing about lighting in the entire <laughs> team yeah they were like we can count on jeff for that part we're just we're not going to consult dave or nate or dylan um because <laughs> they would jeff and they're right for that them. they were smart for yeah. that <laughs> they were so right and that is their that yeah they're valid for not consulting those chaotic people um and I feel like it's interesting that then they pass it to Lucas or like I actually almost imagine them being like okay so we're gonna go well we're not gonna go give this to them because we don't we're afraid but someone's gonna go give this to them and Dylan's like oh I can do it but then Mm -hmm. Lucas is like no 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 I'm gonna do it because (laughs) yes no exactly (laughs) he definitely did like I love that they kind of come off like he comes off here like he's like, oh, I could not be bothered to do this. But like in his, like we know like two seconds later when he's like, oh, I was just preparing them. That it's like he wanted to, he's, mm-hmm. I wrote in my notes later, he's such a diva. Like he really is. He's so yeah. dramatic. <laughs> he just did this just for like the moment, like the drama. Yes. <laughs> he's so dumb. Um, But so yeah, he gives it to them. He's like, here you go, whatever. And to be mean to him back you know they're all like oh my god like lucas you're gonna perform oh my god (laughs) and of course sparkle like takes it too literally and it's like you're gonna embarrass yourself because you're a dumbass um and lucas though you know he takes that in stride he's like and i think it says here like it's it's this him laughing along is scarier than if he showed anger yeah. And he says, I'd be careful if I were you, Minkus, to progress through each station. You have to get approval from a senior technician to confirm that your work is of a satisfactory quality. Do you have any guesses who that senior technician might be? And then Charlie's like, is it you? <laughs> <laughs> um, again, here's another example. Charlie and Lucas interacting, actually having a line exchanged between each other when they don't ever and then don't again for like 17 episodes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I also, I love that moment there of Farkle being like, oh shit. And then like Charlie answers the question because Charlie's like, well, someone's got to answer the question. <laughs> yeah, he's such a little goody two-shoes. It's very yes, cute. Yes, he is. He's such a nerd. You can almost, I, I feel like that 
that scene almost has like um like Parks and Rec kind of uh, modern family vibes where they like look at the camera and you can <laughs> almost imagine um Charlie kind of d- doing that is it you and then like awkwardly like in a fearful way kind of glancing at the camera and then it just like <laughs> pans to Farkle and like zooms in on his face being like so scared <laughs> uh, so good and then we have another little Lucas um reverse smiley face it's like his his text tick um <laughs> so yes then we move on to where I don't know why like Riley and Issa aren't sitting with everybody else but whatever it's fine um so they're oh, like the over thing. at their okay. table well they're at the techie table so I guess that's fine um they're hanging out at the techie table. They're chatting. Riley's so excited for Issa to do the performance. And then oh, they're interrupted when Lucas comes and sits next to them. And he bumps Riley's shoulder when he sits down next to her. Uh, big dramatic <laughs> moment there. Um, and so, of course, it's, it's so interesting actually to me that Issa's like the one to be like, Lucas, like, don't fuck shit up. Like, could you not? Like, don't make this a big deal. And this is an enough. interesting character thing she's like i'm done i'm very tired i'm very tired yes right now and i don't need it so just please i don't need it lucas stop (laughs) and then he has his i I was just preparing them he's devious um and then they talk a little bit about like i just don't want more trouble i want things to go back to normal uh i want things to be chill it's never gonna be chill it's Adams. Um, but mm-hmm. Issa has this line that I highlighted as foreshadowing, well, irony foreshadowing, where she says, I just want everything to be normal now. That's it. No changes, no drama, just normalcy. And I highlighted that because, like I said, Issa says that and it's like she just jinxed her whole life. Cause like mm-hmm. no the entire time has she ever had normalcy? No. No. She has not had normalcy since ever, actually. I was going to say since, like, season one, episode blank, but no, never. Her entire life, like, it's not. It's just never going to be. Unfortunately for her, she suffers from a interesting life. Yes. So, and to cue that, um, Yogi runs in asking if everybody's seen this bulletin that was posted on this tabloid website, which is about, it's just, it's just talking shit, you know. It's like about Issa connecting to Val and all that kind of stuff. Um, one thing about the shot that I love is it says that, you know, he puts his phone down and then all of them lean over to look at it. This is a visual, a shot that I have had so clearly in my head since I wrote this episode. Just mm-hmm. that shot of like it would be from the perspective of the phone. And so it's like you see all of their heads like come into frame and like look at this yeah. thing. And just, like, their expressions and, like, that angle very stylistically. Like, I have always thought, like, that is a a quintessential ambition shot. Like, if I was going to make a a GIF set of, you know, just, you know, generic ambition GIFs. Like, if I was just making a generic set for the show, that would be one of them oftentimes. Because I think it's just so, it's so vivid in my head. I love that. Many of the love- random things that are just in my head, you know? I don't know. Yeah, but that's one of them. <laughs> a little bit like it's playing with that theme of, like, they're being kind of watched and commentary of the social media. Mm-hmm. Love it. So then there's this Sean and Angela scene, but I don't really it's have not to say. It's um, not important, but they're, <laughs> you know. They're there. They're doing their thing. It's fine. They're, happy, they're being inappropriate at school. That's fine. Um, <laughs> it's like it is so funny to think like wow like they can like kiss at their desks and like be gross but like Jack and Eric in season three were like we can't even look at each other yeah or else we're gonna die <laughs> um, that's a uh, privilege for you it's not nice so then we have this kind of I wrote in my notes that it's like the first kind of like Jarek family scene um because it is Jack and Eric and Riley and Issa and Lucas all in one scene together um for the first time and it's you know oh my god I didn't even notice because it seems so normal but yeah yeah. right yep this is the first time that they're all in a scene like this together um and Lucas and Riley are like very like impassioned on Issa's behalf like this is so bad like we need to do something about it something needs to be done and what I love that I highlighted to talk about is like 
that Jack is also like that. I think there's such an interesting similarity and tie from like between Jack and Riley and Lucas of like them all kind of reacting in a similar way and then like Issa and Eric just kind of like sitting there patiently waiting for everybody else to shut up so that like they can actually discuss what they need to discuss I think that speaks both interestingly to the three of them and it speaks really interesting to Issa and Eric's dynamic yeah yeah it just kind of (laughs) makes me think like later on if they were all to be you know cohabitating ever Mm -hmm. it would really be Issa and Eric sometimes just being like okay uh-huh yeah <laughs> and like waiting for that everyone else to leave <laughs> yeah yeah it's I just think they're all so interesting um and I also think it's so interesting how in this you know you think and I still think this is generally true but like you think Lucas would be obviously he's riled up right now but like you would think Lucas would be like the quiet one of mm. this group of people but I think it, it says so much about you know, particularly later seasons, but, like, how he is comfortable around this Mm -hmm. mini makeshift family, that he he does have a voice. He's not as quiet or unspoken as he is in a lot of other settings. Yeah, he believes that he's safe there, and, ah, beautiful. I love him. I love my family. I love my parents. I love my siblings. (laughs) So, yeah, they're like, okay, well, we need to do something about this. And Issa, surprising to all of them, is like, actually, I just want to, like, not think about it and just forget about it. Can we do that? Great. Um, and Jack, so nicely, is like, well, I, I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to get to the bottom of it for you. And Issa says, oh, yeah? You can't even figure out who's running an anonymous Instagram account for a high school of 200 students. You're really going to deduce the source of a nationally printed tabloid? Sure. Give it a try. Like, okay, dragon. Okay. <laughs> like, to her principal. Yeah such a drag but she's like not wrong so (laughs) so true but jack's gonna do his best and that's what matters um i also love the exchange that jack and lucas have where he says you know i think this is the first time you've left one of our offices without saying something inappropriate or knocking something over and lucas says revolution is beautiful isn't it that's a good line it is beautiful it is um so they all leave and we get in our next phase in eric's afternoon or morning or whatever time this is uh that he has arranged a meeting with zay and charlie i love um, this because charlie's yeah. like, it's like he walks in and he's like oh no like this is like a gay meeting yeah <laughs> i had the same note i was like charlie walks into his meeting and he's like am i in trouble for being gay <laughs> yeah he's like wait eric is about to be like so you guys are gay <laughs> literally that's exactly what went through his head in that moment you know that is it and it's so funny because it's like charlie there are like ten thousand other logical explanations as to why he could call you in here the two of you specifically like did why i mean i know why his brain went there but like why didn't your brain be like oh we're both dancers you know like that's like the first obvious thing is like we're both dancers we're both nice which is the main reason that they were brought there but no that you know the panic is there it's, it is yep. at the forefront of his mind because the first thought he has is, oh my god, I'm about to be called out for being gay. <laughs> and it's also uh, like, why would that even be the case, Charlie, when Zay is openly queer? So, like, what what did he think this was going to be? <laughs> it's all scary. It's a nightmare for Charlie. He probably did have a nightmare about this, like, that night. True. He probably had the, like, exact thing replay instead, instead of being like, you guys are cute and popular. Everyone likes you. Be nice. <laughs> It was like, yeah. you guys are cute and popular and gay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I really think it's so funny that he was like, oh my, like, he was like, oh my god, this is going to be a problem. And then Eric is literally like, you guys are, like, universally liked. <laughs> <laughs> like, that was different, wasn't it? Oh my god. He, this man, my boy, an idiot. Poor thing. And... And then Charlie gets an excuse to, you know, partner up with Zay and exchange looks and be a mm-hmm. team. And, you know, it's like, it's just, it's just business. It's business professional. It's, um, it doesn't have to be anything except it, because he pats him on the shoulder. Yeah. And mm-hmm. that's just a lot. It's, it's a, a lot. Whew. Ooh, child. Charlie's going to have a rough week. But also an amazing week. So it's like it's good, but it's also bad. <laughs> that's like his entire life up to like yeah. season four. Um, so yeah, then we go into 
we kind of foray into this montage performance, which is Strangers Like Me by Phil Collins, which is performed. This is one of those first instances where it's performed by the ensemble, but it's like really just like they're singing it and we don't see it. Like it's not like a performance performance, but it's like their voices, mm. um, which I is one of the that. things I'd love to do in this show. Um, yeah. It, I feel like it happened more in season. I don't know. I think it happens much more in season three, actually, for the most part, um, just because we did a little bit more with, like, the idea of them as a recording entity versus just, like, what's happening in the show. It doesn't happen a lot in season two, but it does happen season one, season three a couple times. Yeah, I definitely love a montage. Montage. (laughs) Um, And I really love, like, the song is so perfect. It just Mm -hmm. fits vibe so well yes um i was gonna say i have a note here that like this song is kind of a sleeper hit like obviously Mm -hmm. it's in real life it's a hit it's a banger but like i've heard i've had so many people since season one like say to me like oh one of my favorite performances is strangers like me like that number and i'm always like oh okay (laughs) like that's great um i think it's partially because of the things that happen during this montage but it's also just like it it worked really well for that moment oh hell yeah i mean it's an iconic montage it really is like a top tier montage of all time i think because (laughs) you you don't just have like it's not short there's a lot of things happening Mm -hmm. and i think into a you know a three minute song or something like that Yeah, and it's it's there's comedy there's Mm -hmm. romance you know there's sort of angst in a way mm-hmm. um, what more could you ask it is so it is so good and the lyrics you know for different moments are like okay whew, all right um speaking of all these little moments um one of the comedy ones is where Issa is trying to run them through Kate stage mechanics and almost knocks Farkle off the stage um it's funny but I also wrote down in my notes uh Farkle near death accident climbs to two we're at two count now because yeah. he almost got crushed and now he's almost been plunged off the stage. So his uh, dance with death yeah. continues. It's a motif. Mm-hmm. Then we have here um, Charlie looking at Say while they're supposed to be teaching dance and he gets sweaty palms and he's like, why do I have sweaty palms? Like, you know, Charlie, you know why you have sweaty palms. A little over. But it's funny because he gets pulled away from Dylan being like, hey, like, we still need help. Can you help me with this? And in my head, I just see it as, like, Dylan saw him panicking and, like, kind of losing his shit and was like, I got to save the baby gay. And so he was like, hey, I need your help real quick. Could you come here? I'm saving you. I'm throwing you a life preserver. (laughs) Aw, yes. I love that. That's so cute. Because he would. He's like, oh, man, look at him. He's suffering. Then we have watch this i can't watch this anymore yeah (laughs) then we have this moment for riley and lucas and the lyric why do i have this growing need to be beside her Mm -hmm. and they're teaching dave and lucas are teaching them about like crew and like moving set pieces all this stuff and i what i love about this little moment is just riley making everyone laugh with just like a little aside or like you know she's just so cute like i love her I i love she is just that thing of like They needed her. They so needed her there because she just brings this, like, nice little joy. And I think it's so refreshing. She's outgoing enough, Mm -hmm. but not in a deeper way. Yeah. So it works. And then we also have the performers teaching the techie stuff. And I have a highlight here, again, talking about little character things. Um, It talks about how Charlie spends a chunk of time trying to teach Dylan and Dave and Nate how to dance. Um, and I think that he, you know, that he maintains positivity and is really committed to it. And I think that we kind of get this as a theme in small ways throughout the show so far is just, this is one of the first instances of like Charlie as a teacher and with that oh, kind of teaching okay. instincts, like obviously the, we already saw that in 103 when he was a tutor, but I think it's, you just see it in more like small natural ways where like his natural instinct is to help people and to And that he has the patience and the, like, the kind of attitude and personality to to be a good teacher. Because 
you know, if Zay was dealing with them, he'd be like, I cannot with you fucking bitches, which is like, that's valid. Like, not everybody's a teacher and that is okay. But like, here is like, you can see that Charlie does have that instinct. Yeah, so true. He really, yeah, he, he shines area, honestly, that you can think of other things as well when like, he's teaching Farkle how to be fit. Mm-hmm. 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 And also, even in this episode later, when he's te- trying to help Farkle with this, the sewing and the stitching, mm-hmm. and he's the one who's, like, really trying to help him and really trying to be optimistic. And Farkle is not a receptive audience, but, like, that's just his instinct. And, you know, Zay is sitting there like, oh, my God. So, like, that's, like, a definitely a big difference between the two of them. But, yeah, I mean, that's just his thing is he he's a teacher. And then I love the little moment between Maya and Lucas of, like, her adjusting everybody's posture and then he just glares at her and she's like I don't know <laughs> I don't want to deal with this I think it also is interesting though like that they have that kind of disdainful grr moment but at the same time that also shows begrudging respect that they have yes. because if Maya did not truly did not you know respect him at all she would have just violated his personal space and been like, fuck you. I'm going to, like, show you how to do this. So, kind of like Missy. Um, But, like, you know, I think that's one thing that's so interesting about their dynamic because I fully believe, especially in season two, do I believe they do not like each other? Yes. But I think that Maya particularly, as we've seen in the show, like, Maya tends to... Her respect for people is not tied to whether she likes them. She respects people for, like, are they talented are they strong personalities? Like, she she hates Brandon, but she respects him because he's a bad mm-hmm. bitch and he gets things done and he knows what he wants and he's strategic and all of these things. And so I think even if she doesn't like Lucas as a person, at least in, you know, the first couple seasons, I think that she respects that, you know, like, he has leadership capabilities and he is assertive in his sense of, like, he will only do what he wants to do. He's got, like is stubborn and sticks up for what he wants. So I think that that's what she respects, even if she is like, he is so annoying. (laughs) Yeah. Do you think there's any like under the surface kind of respect over the fact that they're both like some of the less fortunate Hmm. class members as well? That's a good question. I feel like at this point, no partially because maya's thing is a secret right now people don't know that she's you know on the poverty line um but later i think that that they do kind of have little tiny bonding moments over that um you know the fact that their presidency and their administration is so based around scholarship and that's something that maya actually admires about his idea and that they have like the money 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 in season three and stuff like that so i think that they have a comparison there but I think this early on it's not a factor but it kind of becomes a factor later and I think as well that like they both I think come to have relatability in the in their family situations where it's like obviously yes like Kenneth is there um but he obviously is like not really a dad and I think that they both have very unique relationships with their mothers where, like, obviously Maya and Katie is, like, the mother-daughter relationship. And then, like, Lucas, I think, obviously the relationship... Someday we'll talk way more about this. Obviously the relationship between Lucas and Grace is, like, very complicated and not quite, like, a mother-daughter... Or daughter... Mother-son thing. But Mm -hmm. at the same time, I think that he's, like, very protective of his mom and, like, wants what's best for her. And so I think that that is something that they can respect in one another is, like, the way that they want to want their moms to have the best even if the way that they relate to their moms is different you know yeah i see that i see that so yeah Mm. that's completely not related to anything in this episode but (laughs) that's a little tip that was an interesting question so unpacking we are unpacking things are being unpacked we got the suitcase open (laughs) so then we get into this beautiful moment um where it transitions on the bridge and they Riley is going into the booth with Lucas for the first time um which is this is a a big deal because as we know like it was made a big deal in 102 about her even getting close to the booth was like hey you're not supposed to be here get out get away from my space 
So now that he is like letting her in by choice with yeah. permission, it's a big deal. Him. And I think it's special too because the significance of this to me is like there's such a huge theme of like between Riley and Lucas of shared space and the definition of home and where your home is. Yeah. And obviously that becomes much bigger later in a more kind of literal sense, but him letting her in here, the booth is his home right now. It's where he spends most of his time. It's where he is after school. It's where he sleeps. It is his space. True. So for him to be letting her into his current temporary home is a big deal it is it's very symbolic of that line that we just had before where it's like i want to like he actually oh, this is like honestly such a good lucas episode like he's really he's kind of at one of his like most thrivingness in this episode of the whole mm-hmm. series so far like like and when i say so far i mean like up to season four like there is not that many episodes where he's just like mm-hmm. kind of vibing things and in this one he actually is that's a really interesting point we'll have to that just made me think we'll have to do an episode sometime i don't know when but sometime where we kind of talk about like what are the quintessential episodes for each character if we had to Mm. define them that'd be really interesting yeah that'd be good so yeah um i mean the lyrics here you know like come with me now to see my world do you feel the things i feel right now with you take my hand there's a world i need to know like whoo oh boy there's this part here as they we go back into it we go into another ending little montage people are starting to get the hang of things it's great um and then there's it Far- farkle is the downbeat of all of this and that he is still struggling and he can't seem to get anything done and it says poor poor little diva and i just wrote poor poor little diva could be a tagline for the entire show <laughs> <laughs> poor poor little diva it's like poor poor little diva and poor poor little rich boy <laughs> Poor, poor little diva rich boy. That's our Farkle. We're still in the technician's booth as this montage rolls to an end. Um, We're still there with Riley and Lucas and she is getting her lesson on lighting from him, which again, it's kind of funny that like Lucas is doing this and not Jeff. I'm like, where is Jeff? What is he doing? Um, But good for him that Jeff is like, no, you fucking do it. I don't want to do it. Love that for him. Jeff would be like learning a dance or something right or he could be like choreographing their project yeah except they also haven't picked what their project is so maybe he just built some choreography and then was like well we have to pick a song that fits the things i made because i already did it so who's to say um but yeah no matter where he is i hope he's you know he's having a good time he always is is having a good time lucas he's like Totally, he's totally using this. I mean, Lucas, when will you ever this <laughs> Bro. And that's the thing is, like, I feel like all these, because this happens more than once in this episode, which is one of my favorite little recurring bits of this episode. But he, like, it says in the thing that it's that kind of classic maneuver, like him putting his hands on hers to move the sliders is like, we all, we all know what that is evocative of, of that kind of thing of, let me teach you how to do this. The thing about it is, though, is that I don't think, lucas is thinking about that like i think he literally is just like oh let me show you and i don't know how to teach people things without doing it and then he does that and then in that moment he has a moment of being like wait (laughs) hold on (laughs) now i can't move i'm frozen (laughs) things are happening like it's true like he's not he is not smooth so he really is just he's stumbling through this and somehow succeeding but (sighs) This guy. But I will say, I mean, to me, I think the, the idea of that that touch, the delicacy of, like, hands and the touch of hands is, like, mm-hmm. so motif-driven in RL's relationship. Like, I, I wish, again, I wish I could gift this because if I would, I would have made a series by this point already of, like, the yeah. ways that hands are so important in their relationship they're such a visual motif um so i will just say for now there's there's a beautiful moment of that and then i will just continue to say that every time it comes up again (laughs) (laughs) yeah that's fair i mean 
do you think he knows here that he likes her? Uh, that's a that's a good question. I feel like I don't know. I feel like kind of again. I mean, we talked about how Charlie and Lucas are like the same person, but they're not. Um, but I feel like he, unlike Charlie, I don't think it's denial necessarily. But I think that he just. A, you know, as we've talked about, like, he is demisexual, so I think that he doesn't have the same experience or the same conception of, like, Mm -hmm. having crushes as most other people. Like, Riley is his second crush ever, and his first one was Asher, which lasted for two weeks, and then he was like, I'm not doing this anymore, and then it went away. Um, So I think that this is is all very new for him, so I think it might just be, like, he feels something, but Mm. he doesn't know what it is and is a little, like what the fuck Uh, i'm scared of this so i think and that and that's what's so interesting too is we'll talk about this when we get there but there's the part where it's like he says uh, during their dance like it's like oh he's fallen right like it's like he says he's falling head over heels and what i think is so funny about that is that it says that so we have this instinct there of like okay he must know like he's feeling something but i love that it says that and then the next like four episodes he like does nothing to communicate that he has had that realization and feels that way like he still remains very like closed in and like aloof and you know it's just so lucas to be like oh i think i like this person well i'm not going to change anything about my behavior and i'm just going to continue to be yeah the way i I am another problem to live with isn't it yeah so it's like a question i think he probably he i think he maybe understands in a objective sense like oh i'm i must be into Riley but I don't think he really understands you know what I mean like he's like he can't connect it yet it's not like real like he's like okay I feel this but I don't I don't I'm it, I get yeah, that blah, blah. so like I feel like he it's gonna take him the next couple episodes to kind of lean more into that and continue to be like well oh maybe eh, I don't know <laughs> Then um, I also highlighted just this little line here about the way that she describes why she thinks he likes the booth, where she Mm -hmm. says, the way it's sort of removed has this sense of quiet isolation, but how you can still see everything. The whole world is within your reach, even if you're safely on the other side. Um, That's, first of all, very uh, observant and introspective, Riley. Um, But also, I think, true. I think that it it reflects the way that he operates within the world of, like, I'm going to stay where I can see everything and I can be aware of everything, but no one can touch me. And that's a very like protective self-defense thing, but that is the way he operates. And I think the fact that Riley sees that and understands that about him so early on is like, she's got his number. Like she knows, like she, he's like, he even says later in season two, you know, there's parts where he's like, you, you think you know me better than you actually do. And Riley's like, no bitch, I actually do. And she's right. (laughs) Yeah. She's like, I see Mm mm-hmm i think she has she has a line in like 209 or something you know where she's like i don't believe you're like a loo facade i see right through it and he's like i'm not see-through and she's like you're a window you're an open window like to her that's true (laughs) then we have Issa come in hilarious i i love i'm evil for this but as a writer i really love when people get interrupted i think it's funny so (laughs) i do that a lot i'm sure people have noticed yeah i just think it's like it's a great trope and I enjoy it. So sorry to all the romance lovers out there, but there's always a risk that bitches are going to get interrupted because that's what I do. And in this case, Issa was valid. I guess. <laughs> they weren't doing their jobs. So therefore, is a problem. Uh, then we go into the scene where Asher, this is, look in hindsight, this is absolutely hysterical that Asher is teaching Maya and Farkle how to be in the prop loft. Like, if you even think about them trying to do the scene in season three, it mm. would be like <laughs> murder scene. Like Asher's like, I'm going to kill you for stepping in the problem. Get out of my space. And it's like, I'm trying to imagine like, I wonder if it's like kind of a confidence thing for Asher, because we see a little bit of, of this later with Lucas as well in this episode of like, Asher's still kind of very reticent in this episode and like, is always trying to play things down and like keep things cool and not cause trouble and all this kind of stuff. But then like, In later seasons, you know, once he's kind of had his whole reckoning with Lucas and gains confidence from that, like, he loses that a bit. And I think at this point, maybe it's just that he was not yet 
confident enough to be like, Maya, bitch, I hate you. Get out of my space. Um, <laughs> but you can kind of even, just the way he's like over explaining things and then he like dies when Farkle knocks something over. It's like, you can, he's holding it together by a thread yeah. that they're in his space. Um, because yeah, he would like, he already, like he already hates Maya at this point because the thing that they hate each other for happened in freshman year. So like, he hates her, but he's like, okay, I have to, I have to be professional and nice and like a good person. And then by season three, he's like, no, fuck that. Yeah, <laughs> Get her like, out of here. He no longer is strong. In, no, he's stronger in season three. Yes, exactly. But it's also funny that like of all, all that being said that like Farkle is the one who fucks everything up is like, yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, so then we have the scene with the techies. They're trying to decide what they're going to do. This is another kind of like iconic fun techie scene. Um, with them trying to get the ideas and Lucas has, Lucas and Dave have their famous exchange of, I'd rather cut my feet off with a rusty hacksaw than do this. And then Dave goes, well, that would hurt. Yes, it would. So then they're like, this is not going to work. We need to just break up for now, especially because Lucas is not being helpful and he's really not helping the situation. And then Issa hangs back and like continues to really work on it and seems to be really into it. So I think it's a very interesting little hint there of like, oh, like, Maybe she's kind of into this, you know? Hmm. Interesting, Isa. It's a very subtle beginning. Well, not really. It's sort of (laughs) begun already because just because things have changed so much in her life. But it's a very, like, people keep kind of going, like, ha, ha, ha. Like, you know, Riley saying, what are you going to perform? It's very, it's like, it's happening. The idea that the seeds are planted. (laughs) It's kind of one of those things of, like, that idea of this episode planting long-term things. Mm. That's another example of that. Um, So let me go into the scene. Sean and Angela are being gross again. Um, And then, who interruption! (laughs) Jack comes in and interrupts them. And he's like, okay, like, I figured it out. Like, I I went on this rabbit hole and, like, I sent them very persuasive emails to get, which I'm like, what does he think is a persuasive email? And I love that he thinks that's dramatic. Um, but basically Jack, I just think he's so funny in this scene, but then he tells them that the IP address for this person who was talking shit about Issa to the tabloids was coming from the school. So now we know it's from the inside. <gasps> coming from inside the school. The call and he just, is inside he the house. To tell them that, like immediately. And he needed to tell them that it's interesting that he didn't go tell Eric that, but. Mm-hmm. It's just, you know, it's too early on at this point. He doesn't trust Eric yet. Eric is not his go-to bae, you know? But we're getting there. We're getting there in this episode. Then we get into the scene with Maya and Katie. Maya has this really lovely line where she's talking about how she wants to be clear that she appreciates everything that her mom does. She says, I've been doing manual labor and things for other people eight hours a day for two days, and I want to die. You, you do it all the time and don't even bat an eye. I don't think I appreciate that enough. I love you. Yeah. And to me, one of the things we were talking about characters and little things like that, I think one thing that really shines in this episode kind of underratedly is Maya's humanity. I feel like it's so on display in this episode in ways where it's like, there's other episodes later where it's much more obvious, like a lot of the stuff around Farkle and season two and stuff like that. But I think this is an episode where like, it's just there in very subtle ways, like the way that she is with her mom and the way that she is with Issa later. Like there's a couple of moments that I'll point out. I just think especially since like season three i mean listen one of my favorite things about maya is that she's insane and it's so fun to write her that way and i love that she's like unapologetically a diva batshit diva Mm -hmm. but i think it can become really easy then to to forget her humanity and forget her like that there is undercurrents of emotion going on there and so i love moments like this where it's like no like maya is she has humanity and she is a caring person in her own way and i think we're i will say you know we're gonna see a lot more of that in in these last couple seasons season four and season five she kind of we get a little more of a focus on that but Mm -hmm. i just love the small moments of it here even before everything else she really doesn't learn yet to show that to other people Mm -hmm. it's such a big character development for her in that showing her weaknesses isn't gonna make her weaker yeah love it so then we get they have a playful like little exchange and we get 
another great performance for the episode, which is Nine to Five by Dolly Parton. And it starts as Maya and Katie and then becomes Maya and the class. Um, to me, this is a legacy ambition performance. It's just, mm. it is, this song belongs to ambition now. I'm sorry to say to everybody else, but Nine to Five is an ambition song. No arguments. Uh, I love that, you know, the the pour myself a cup of ambition moment and Maya laughing at that. Um it's inside joke. Um, and I just think it's it's so cute to see them get to sing together and perform together. And then it kind of continues that like upbeat fun vibe that this episode has. And it's also just, of course, an amazing song. So. Love it. Yeah. No, it's really good um, as well because it is that like, I mean, Maya, she enjoys performing so much that usually going to school and just performing isn't like that hard. Mm-hmm. so this is a good I don't know it is a good way for her to start understanding like you can tell she's starting to understand that the techies do work hard because this song kind of signifies that so mm-hmm. yeah and also like what she said to Katie too about like I've been doing all this hard work and it sucks don't make me do it anymore so yeah I just it's just a it's a fun song and I love it and this is also like yeah, I don't even know what I was just going to say there. But it's so fun and I love it. So it's very, uh, this song, this episode has like a couple of, I think like, oh, these are songs that when you think of ambition, like you think of this, you know? And yeah. I think this is one of them. Definitely. 